Welcome to my sewing room. We have so many beautiful things for you today. I think you're going to really have fun. My friend Peggy Dilbon will be with us a little bit later. And Peggy has brought this beautiful pillow to share that has all kinds of machine embroidery. There isn't one bit of handwork on it. Now, one of the most interesting things is this beautiful little basket in the middle. Peggy took a regular machine embroidery design and with some cross-stitch software, she converted it into cross-stitch. This is one of my all-time favorite projects. For those of you that are so fortunate as to have an, a machine which embroiders, uh, you can take a little baby pillow or make a baby pillow or a baby pillow case, and this says, Precious Child of God, put the child's name and the date of birth, and you have one of the most adorable uh, and special gifts to give a newborn baby that I could ever think about. Another one of my favorite techniques is the double Madeira. And the double Madeira technique is on the bottom of this wonderful tea towel, again with some uh, machine embroidery and a little bit of hand tatting. Machine embroidery can be just as beautiful on children's clothes. This little Jack and Jill dress is called Rebecca's Butterfly Dress. And actually, several of my granddaughters have had a dress made from this pattern with this beautiful machine embroidery. Very simple, tailored, and elegant is this white linen blouse with machine embroidered cut work simply around the neck, and it just has a placket in the back, so it's a very easy blouse to make. And if you want to dress up almost any solid color dress, a beautiful see-through organza vest is just the way to do it, especially when you have the wonderful machine embroidery and all of the little uh, goodies on the bottom to make it very, very special. And now won't you come over to the technique boards with me? I am so thrilled about the women's suit patterns that we're featuring on this series. My suit is one of the patterns. This is the scoop neck pattern. And this beautiful suit with our sewing techniques is also the, the same pattern, and yet they look very different. First of all, this pattern has a wonderful dolman sleeve, and I think it's accentuated, accentuated so beautifully with this very large tone-on-tone -tone machine embroidery. Let me bring the sleeve over and just show you how beautiful it is. This is an off-the-edge off the scallop and a, a candle wicking trim. Now, this same trim with the off-the-edge scallop and the candle wicking is used on the placket that goes down the front. And then I have another little secret to show you. Even on the placket here and the side of the jacket, that beautiful little machine candle wicking has been used. And then there's a wonderful skirt, the same skirt as I have on, that matches this beautiful blue linen suit. Now, how do you do all of this wonderful machine embroidery on linen? Well, first of all, you need an iron-on stabilizer. Then fold it in half for the off-the-edge stitching. And then you can do your off-the-edge stitching without any extra stabilizer. To do the candle wicking, however, I have put a piece of tearaway stabilizer behind it so the candle wicking will have just a little bit more stability as I stitch my machine candle wicking. And then after you remove it, this beautiful trim which makes the plackets on this beautiful jacket that I'm going to bring over here with me. I'm so very pleased to have as my guest today my very dear friend and business colleague Peggy Dillbone. Peggy is educational consultant of Husqvarna Viking. She is also a Martha Pullen licensed teacher, and we have just returned from a wonderful sewing cruise where we had the best time. We did. And Peggy, I'm just so glad to have you at Martha's Sewing Room today. Martha, thank you for having me here again. I just love this. Thanks. But, so and you much. know what? If, if you if you viewers will notice, Peggy also has on the same suit that of the suit she made, the suit I have on, and another suit, and we all look a little bit different. We do. Peggy, show us about this wonderful technique that you've used on this beautiful suit. Okay, well Martha, you and I both know we love easy things. <laughs> Basically, what I did with this off-the-edge scallop was choose one of our built-in scallop stitches on the sewing machine. And I ironed on interfacing. I just took my iron, pressed the interfacing to my fabric, and then I folded the fabric so I would have a finished edge to stitch on and the interfacing gave it some body. 
what I did next was to just stitch the scallops off the edge of the fabric. And you do that by setting it at a certain place on the foot so that you could do that. After I stitched the scallops, then we did the candle wicking. And the candle wicking, I did put some stabilizer in there and then took the stabilizer off to finish the placket. Now I'm going to show you just how easy it is to stitch the scallop off the edge of the fabric. Just the placement of the fabric under the foot and the scallop stitches beautifully off the edge and it pulls the fabric into a scallop stitch so that it, it, that straight edge actually looks scallop now from the way it's stitched. And just that little bit of interfacing gives it some body but you don't want to stabilize it too much or else it would uh, it wouldn't scallop and what I really pull. love in watching that too, Peggy, is that I know you're not going to have to go in there and trim the bottom of that There's scallop. There's no trimming. Oh, that and is I used um, a rayon thread in the top and the bottom to do that. And what I'm going to do is just stop it now. And then I'm going to show you my second technique, which is a candle wicking stitch. Oh, I love that candle wicking. I used to do a lot of that by H-A-N-D, but now that I, oh, that's beautiful. The beautiful uh -huh. skull. It's a beautiful skull. Now what I did was program in a candle wicking stitch, and the program for candle wicking, it can be a zigzag stitch, or it can be a tri-motion stitch, a multi-motion stitch, and that's what I've used on uh, this particular one, so it doesn't build up. And the foot that we use is a candle wicking foot that has a groove underneath so it will ride over those bumps really well. And I simply place the fabric under there, but this time I do need the stabilizer. Is it just a little heavier stitching, Peggy? Yes, it's a very stabilizer. heavy stitch. It's a buildup of zigzag stitches or back and forth stitches. You can see how it goes back and forth and back and forth and builds up. So I needed that much more stabilizer. And as I'm doing that, it's just simply stitching that beautiful candle wicking stitch that gives it a really pretty accent. You know, the candle wicking stitch would be beautiful on children's clothes, on ladies' clothes. It just gives that tiny little look. It's and nice, so delicate. Very nice little accent. Can you program it as small as you want or as long yes. as you want? Yes, you can change the programming. You can make it uh, larger, smaller and you can have them set a little closer together if you wanted to. Just let. And there's the beautiful candle wicking stitch those, with this off the edge scallop. Those delicate little dots. And you know what I'd like to show our viewers one more time? Yes. Let's let them see on this beautiful blue linen suit exactly what the candle wicking stitch looks like and that beautiful scallop off the edge that you did not have to trim. That's what I especially like about that particular scallop. And then you used it on, on both sides, on the top placket and on the bottom placket too. Mm -hmm. And, and then, around, uh, then around on the sleeves. What an elegant trim for a lovely summer linen suit. Thank and you, next we have a garment construction tip for you. Peggy, I cannot wait to see the magic you're going to do with wash away basting thread. I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> okay, Martha. Well, have you ever sewn gathering and you had to pick out your threads after you attached your skirt to your oh, um, yes. ruffle or something? My whole life. <laughs> I know. Well, we have wash away basting thread. And what I did was simply stitch two rows of gathering thread with wash away basting thread in the bobbin. And then in the bobbin only, the bobbin okay. only regular thread on the top. And then I pulled up my gathers by pulling the gathering threads so that I had my nice even gathers. And then I attached it to, this would be like putting a skirt, a ruffle on the bottom of a skirt. I attached it with a straight stitch with regular thread. And then, oops, my thread was showing, my gathering thread. So normally I would have had to pick all that out. Okay. But what I'm doing is just giving it a spritz of water and that thread releases and you just pull it away because the wash away basting thread disappears. Oh, Peggy, so that, that thread is, so is wonderful. Gone. And you can also do it with a gathering foot. Now this one I did with a gathering foot and I have the gathering foot on my sewing machine right now. I'm gonna show you how to, how to stitch this. Now the wash away basting wash thread away. is in the bobbin. Yes, ma'am, okay. it's in the okay. bobbin, okay. regular thread on the top and you set it for whatever amount of gathers that you want. And with the gathering foot, which is wonderful, I use my left needle position so it gives me a nice wide 
border. I just stitched it the same way, but it automatically gathered the fabric for me. And then so when have you sew it down, gathers. then you just spritz it with the water and it all goes away. Sewed it down, and again, when I folded this back, my gathering threads were showing. And? We <laughs> spritz it with the water. And in just a couple of seconds, let the water soak in for a couple of seconds. Then you can just remove this top thread very easily. It just pulls away. Oh, Peggy, that is so wonderful. When I think of all Snickle. those gathers, all those ruffles on the dresses for Joanna I made, that you picked and out. had to pick out the gathers. Peggy, thank I did you. The same so thing. <laughs> Thanks, Martha. Thank you so much for being here. I've just loved having you. Oh, you're you. so welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and next, I have a quilt square for you. I love this quilt. I've called it the Blue Danube quilt because it has such wonderful shades of blue as its primary color. Now the Celtic lace shaping square, which we're going to talk about today, it, this is Celtic lace shaping and that comes, the term comes from the quilting industry. The, some of the laces go under and some of the laces come over. And actually I've used the same design on this Celtic lace shaping right here that is lace shaping. I used the same design that I used on the bias lace shaping. It's not bias lace shaping, bias shaping, Celtic bias shaping. Now come on over and let me just show you how easy it is to do Celtic lace shaping and attaching the lace and of course doing all of the work on a sewing machine. First of all, you have to trace off your design. And I trace the center of the design in case I wanted to put anything in the center. Of course, you got to have the center of your square, but also sometimes we put machine embroidery like we did in the center and in the center of each one of these little petals. So I trace off my design. And by the way, I also trace the miter points because the laces must be mitered on the end. Then I have come in, of course, you have to have glass head pins, please. And I'm going to put my pins on the outside edge. Let me move my hand here a little bit so you can see. I put my pins on the outside edge and when I pull around in a curve I have to pull a little, give it, make it a little bit taut, not tight but taut because a little bit later I'm going to pull the thread that's built into the lace and make it lie flat. All right, now then here I'm, put a, I'm ready to do my miter now. So I'll put a pin at the t bottom. I'll put a pin at the top. And I will fold the lace back on itself, removing the inside pin. And I'm going to show you a little magic. When I open it up, a perfect miter has been folded in. And then to make the lace lay down, the French and English laces have this wonderful little drawstring that's built right into the, the heading of the lace. So I find that little string. And by the way, the, uh, the string, there are several strings built in. Here, let me just pull it. And do you see how that lace just lies there perfectly after I pull that little string? Now I use glass head pins only when I do lace shaping because watch what I'm going to do after I've shaped my lace. I'm going to put my iron down right on top of this lace, pins and all, maybe even give it a shot of steam. Put the iron, and you do not want plastic pins when you're going to put a hot iron right down on top of them. And then after it's all shaped and pressed, I will carefully remove the pins just a few at a time. Some people said, Martha, how do you ever get that off the board? Well, here's how you do it. You remove the pins just a few at a time and then pin it flat after you've given it a little bit of a spray starch and a press. And you just systematically remove the pins and pick it up off the board and pin it. Now, let me just share with you that I love the pin stitch. Let me be sure I can pull this pin out. No sewing machine company recommends sewing over pins that I have found yet. So I'm going to use a wing needle and a pin stitch to attach my lace. I absolutely love pin stitching and wing needling. Now here's a little trick. If you want your little, you want the hole on this wing needle stitch to be a little smaller, you don't use a wing needle at all, you will use just a large needle, such as a 100 needle. But see how pretty it is to do the pin stitch and just to come all the way around on this beautiful lace shaping. And after it's all attached, I have one done here that has most of it attached. After it's all attached, then I will go back in and pull away the stabilizer and trim the fabric from behind the lace to make it peekaboo. 
And next I have some silk ribbon embroidery stitches for you. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today my very dear friend and business colleague, Beverly Sheldrick. Beverly is from New Zealand. Beverly travels to teach at the Martha Pullen School of Art Fashion uh, in Huntsville twice a year, and we've also taught both in New Zealand and Australia too, Beverly. And she writes for many, many magazines and also is the author of her own book. Beverly, welcome to the Thank show. Thank you, Martha. <laughs> it's always just so good to be here with you and to have a little bit of time to talk with your viewers. Now today, I'm going to be talking about this beautiful sweet pea. Now you'll see that it's on the blouse at the bottom of that little oval. And here we have a completed one here. Now this is a very pretty flower. It does take just a little bit of time to do, but I think it's worth the effort. Now you can see here that I've done the first step, which is this little ruffled section here. I've then taken the slightly darker colour to put the little piece here and then I've got the stitches at the bottom here and also you can see that I have the trail there. Now this is, it's not difficult to do but it just takes a little bit of time. So I can, you can see I've got some of this 7mm silk ribbon and what I'm going to do ladies is I'm just, and gentlemen, there are men because I know there are men that do silk ribbon, but what I want you to see is that I'm just taking a little whip stitch like this and I'm going over and over and then when I've got four or five stitches, I will just pull it up like that. And then I will put my needle down and in that way I've gathered it up. Now I'm going to continue just going round like a little half hoop like that. And you can see there's the first half there. Then when I've got it as big as I need, then I will just take it through to the back. Now to do this little section here, I'm actually showing it to the viewers in 7mm. I really did it in, um, in the 4, but I'm using 7mm just to make it a little bit easier for people to see. Because here, I'm just going to take that through to make it easier for everybody to see. But you can see how to get this little pointed section, I'm actually going to put the needle in there. This is a ribbon stitch and because I'm putting it on the side here like this, then when I pull that through, you will see how it's going to curl around like that. And then the second one will just go exactly the same way, but I will put it on the other side like that. Now the leaves, again I'm showing it to you in the bigger ribbon to make it easier and this time we're just dropping it instead of going up and once more it's that same technique of just pulling it through like that and making it curl at a different angle. The side ones are little side stitch ones, the middle one is just the normal one through the middle but just dropping them down and of course the vines are very easy ladies they're simple and gentlemen goodness <laughs> I really must remember that we do have these in viewers simply just a little um, a little outline stitch just like this just a little back but it is important when you're going through this section here to take really tiny little stitches because otherwise you, it doesn't go round easily and I often will actually split those stitches because in that way it keeps them in the position that we want to, them to go. So you can see how just like that and round and there it is. I think really a very pretty, you can trail your vines really as far as you want them to go. You can put in as many as you like, but it just adds that little bit of extra, um, 
I can't think of the right word at this moment, but you know what I mean. Extra pizzazz. Yes, yes. Or extra, extra delicacy, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but you will either use a single strand or two strands two of stranded strands. cotton. Look really good. Oh, Beverly, those little sweet peas are so beautiful. <laughs> and thank you so much for being here. You always bring such joy to the show. Thank you. And now I have a craft for you. This project is so cute. It's a fabric covered clipboard. You know, you just slip a notepad under there and you might say, now Martha, wait a minute. Why are you doing a fabric covered clipboard? Well, first of all, we love fabric. And secondly, we saw a clipboard similar to this in a very expensive catalog a couple of years ago and they were $50. And I thought, well, we need to kind of share with you how to have a $50 clipboard. First of all, choose some of your favorite fabric, something that goes with your kitchen or your office, wherever you want this pretty clipboard. And by the way, let me just show you, it's covered not only on the front, but on the back. It really is pretty. Now then, very easy to do. First of all, this is the pattern for the back. And that will actually go in and cover up what you wrap around from the front. So you're going to have a fusible, a fusible uh, interfacing and a paperback fusible and you're just going to press it on and then you're ready to pull it off and then you'll use the iron of course to adhere it. But before you put your backing on, you have to make a pattern for the front. So you make a pattern for the front of the clipboard. Now I've got it kind of folded in here. I've already pulled off my fusible back um, fabric. And so I will pull it off, pull off the paper part, come in here, just simply press it down. This is really very easy to do. Come in and make some cuts so it will go right up around where it's supposed to. Also clip the curves on the bottom and then it will be turned over and I'll use my iron to make it really, you know, to make it really lay down. So I will fuse all of this. Actually, I don't have to use my iron on this one. It will stay down just fine. And then I'll bring in my back piece, which I will have cut out after I put all of this down and then put my back piece right on top here. And then if you do this, you're going to have one of those $50 clipboards too. Won't you come along with me to my attic? This is a really pretty ladies nightgown. What makes it so pretty, because it's really very plain too, is this magnificent hand embroidery, of course done white on white with the eyelets and the leaves and the bow and the little eyelets. You see how they make scallops around here? And then the little eyelets make more scallops beneath the flowers and the bows and then those bows go all over. What a magnificent a uh, piece of embroidery. I cannot imagine how much time it took someone to make this this sweet embroidery which was put on this lovely lady's nightgown. For my sewing from the heart today, I have a really sweet letter from Lisa Sheets. She says, hi, Martha. We're a group of 11 so fine ladies. That's what they call their group from Meadville, Pennsylvania. Our volunteer activity is to make receiving blankets for a local charity in our town and also for newborns in need. We collect the flannels needed and then twice a year make around 400 blankets for them. We meet in a large room and bring in all that is needed to cut and sew and iron. When the day is done, so are the blankets. We may be only 11 ladies strong, but believe me, we are many in number. God bless you. It's from Lisa Sheets, Bev Wright, Lois Carr, Nancy Asmus, Peggy McKinley, Diane Frampton, Marie Gordon, Lorraine Gap, Cheryl Weederspawn, Opal Sieber, and Dottie Ware, all the so fine ladies from Meadville, Pennsylvania. And I'll tell you what, I really appreciate, Lisa, your telling me about your group and what it really does go to share with not with our viewers is that it only takes one or two or even 11 people that have a heart to sew for those less fortunate or for those in need and I want to thank all 11 of you so fine ladies from Pennsylvania for sharing this story with us thank you for coming to my sewing room won't you come back next time <laughs>